hours since yesterday's catastrophic assault on the heart of America, more chilling film footage has emerged. Helping to explain what happened, if not how or why. It's now believed the terrified passengers had been herded to the back of the hijacked planes by terrorists armed with knives. Filmed from every angle, these images have been watched and have caused horror around the world. Another cameraman who'd been filming near the famous Twin Towers turned instinctively towards the sound of the diving plane and captured the moment thousands of people perished. It was the inferno caused by thousands of tons of burning aviation fuel that melted steel, weakened the structure and caused the towers to collapse killing thousands who'd survived the initial impact. Experts today said no building could have survived such an attack. Hundreds of firemen and emergency workers were buried by the collapsing towers, adding to the death toll. New York's Mayor Giuliani visited their surviving colleagues, thanking them for working on in such desperate conditions. Uh, it's terrible. I mean, the damage is terrible. The people are doing everything that they can to rescue as many people as possible, and this is going to be a long-term effort. So I just wanted to make sure that everything is here that could be here, and it is. So we just pray to God that we can save a few people. But saving lives in streets where the rubble is now piled higher than most tall buildings elsewhere will not be easy. For all the thousands of people who are missing, very few bodies have been recovered. And it is against this backdrop of cataclysmic damage that the British government has warned that hundreds of British citizens may be among those lost. As the first of the dead were being recovered, their bodies placed in temporary morgues America awaited the response of its president and the military whose intelligence services had failed to stop the fanatics. President George Bush, who will be judged by history on his handling of this crisis, was finally able to return to the White House. He told the nation that terrorists must not be allowed to win. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. The first response of many Americans living in and around New York and Washington has been to offer blood to help the hospitals and medical teams dealing with casualties on an unprecedented scale. If America feels she is now at war, that impression can only be supported by these images. US military and their guns patrolling the streets of Lower Manhattan protecting against an unseen enemy while the enormous rescue operation continues. The emergency teams are exhausted but determined to continue. Many have friends and colleagues on the missing list. New York City officials say 
it could be weeks before it's known just how many thousands of people died here. Paul Davis, ITN. Let's go now to our correspondent, James Mates in New York. James, an extraordinarily eerie day in New York, and particularly so in Lower Manhattan. What's the latest from there tonight? Well, the search and the rescue operation goes on. There were reports overnight of nine people uh, being pulled out of there uh, alive, but since this morning, uh, there do not appear to have been any more survivors, not that we've been told about anyway. We were able this morning to get within about three city blocks of there from where you could smell the smoke and taste the dust in the air. Uh, you couldn't actually get up to the rubble itself, but talking to rescue workers and paramedics coming out, they spoke of a scene of utter devastation of body parts, of bodies littered all over the place, uh, buried in soot. They talked of uh, uh, the attempts to move those uh, dead people into a makeshift mortuary in uh, what was once a Brooks Brothers store. The uh, rubble is being loaded up into trucks and uh, shipped across the Hudson River to Staten Island, from where, which is where the uh, which is where the uh, FBI are going to go through it, uh, looking for evidence and, of course, for any bodies that may be scooped up that way. They're going to do it that way rather than because of the sheer scale of the rubble there to try and do it on site would just take too long. Uh, so a very, very grim situation down there in southern Manhattan, and it's not going to be cleared up quickly. James Mates in New York for the time being. Thank you. Joining me now is Jeff McAllister, the London Bureau Chief of America's Time magazine. Uh, Jeff McAllister, there must be some relief tonight that some people have been held technically, they're not under arrest, but they've been held tonight in Boston in connection with this incident. Absolutely. Um, the notion that it might be possible to find out who perpetrated this and roll back uh, these networks to their source, especially given the scale of the intelligence failure that's represented by the uh, range of attacks, is obviously uh, good news. I talked to one American official who said, in fact, that the bad guys had been very sloppy. It was like a stabbing in a hotel lobby. There were bloody footprints everywhere. And if it's true that this is the case, then I think there will be uh, quick action, perhaps militarily, as uh, the United States develops confidence that its assessment of who's behind this, probably Osama bin Laden, is in fact correct. Well, you talk, you talk about developing confidence, and I want to ask you this. We've heard today from the President, from, Sec from Secretary of State Colin Powell, are you in any doubt the Americans have the resolve to pursue those who might have been responsible for this attack? Absolutely not. Uh, there is no downside in some respects politically for the president to take strict action. And uh, what would anyone expect? What allies will disagree? NATO is invoking Article 5 to make this an act uh, of war against all the members. There may be UN resolutions backing it too. And so why should Americans faced with this devastation uh, lack resolve under these circumstances? You've been sitting here in London working for Time magazine, watching this plethora of images, disturbing, devastating images coming in. What have you learned so far, looking at the pictures and trying to contextualize it, about the, the mood in America? Well, probably we're all in the same boat in, in that respect. Uh, the devastation, the horror, the uh, fear that people sometimes feel, but also combined with uh, acts of heroism and pride and uh, a resolve to go forward. It's a very complicated, uh, I think, set of emotions. But I think there's a lot of recognition that it's a whole new world out there for America. And that's perhaps uh, a source of long-term unease while also confidence that the institutions are going to continue and that the government is, in fact, working quite well. We've been saying it, and it's probably, sadly, lapsed into a kind of cliche, really. But do you think it's challenged the sort of basic assumptions of American life, after all, America the Great, America the Free, these attacks tend to contradict that basic perception. Perhaps not uh, contradicting the Great and the Free. I think it does contradict the Fortress America notion that has been very easy for Americans to have uh, really for uh, centuries and certainly since Pearl Harbor, the last major attack on American soil. Um, this is the disturbing thing that this kind of attack can happen on, in America and not from nuclear weapons or from large ships, the kinds of things that are easy to contend with, in a sense, when you have the world's largest military, but hijacked airplanes, um, small numbers of terrorists who can take uh, the ordinary objects of civilian life and, uh, and render them into huge weapons. This is indeed disturbing, but it is not, I think, just disturbing for Americans, but for British people and French people and indeed for people around the world who have to contend with uh, really a, a whole new reality. Might it have shifted the emphasis from things like missile defense? I don't see any recognition of that so far. Uh, the Republicans 
on the right wing are saying the same things. In fact, they're saying this proves the need for missile defense because it shows that all sorts of threats are out there. Uh, this will be, however, an interesting debate uh, in the days ahead. Jeff McAllister, thank you. Throughout the day, more details have been emerging about the human cost of this tragedy. Estimates and the true number of those who lost their lives are still there. Just estimates, no one can be sure. Families across the length and breadth of the United States have been waiting for news and fearing the worst. In many cases, those worst fears have been realized. Yet in the middle of such a shattering loss of life, there have been remarkable stories of survival and of bravery. Here's Colin Baker. America is struggling to count its victims, innocent victims of a war they knew nothing of, a war undeclared until the first life was taken yesterday morning. And now America and the international community strives also to come to terms with the morality of those fanatics and zealots who planned and succeeded in taking so many lives. The morning the world changed witnessed and photographed by a New York medic, Dr. Mark Heath, who rushed to the World Trade Center, arriving at the very moment the second tower collapsed. I hope I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's uh, incredible. OK, I'm going to have to go find people who need help, because I don't think I'm one of them. You OK, sir? OK. Can I just get a toot off your respirator? Can I get a toot? I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. A toot, as Dr. Heath calls it, is life-giving oxygen from the fireman's breathing apparatus. Okay. Back to you. In the fallout, shadows move slowly, dazed and traumatized. A dusty twilight has obliterated the sunshine and Dr. Heath, stepping on who knows what, feels his way forward in this threatening and suffocating air. This is the car I hid behind. It saved my life. Oh, wait, maybe it was this one. Files, papers, documents, which were in cabinets or on desks, litter the streets now of those who worked with them studied them, tore them up, or even filed them, there is, for the moment, no sign. Not in Dr. Heath's world. There's all these noises. I think it, I don't know what it is. They say someone needs help. Yeah, Mike! Mike! Mike, come over here! Yeah! Anybody need a doctor? Where are you? Don't have oxygen. Fire and rescue teams are clearly in shock, desperate for clean air, but lucky to be breathing even this foul atmosphere. Many of their colleagues were further forward. They will not have survived. I need some oxygen. Someone can with him. 10 4. Thanks. The whistles are from the alarm beacons on the fire officers' suits, a plague of them echoing, but many more crushed into silence. Mark Heath struggles on. A professional, skilled in saving life, and like many others on this morning, driven by concern for others, and all of them distinguished by lack of thought for themselves. They told me just to wait here. It's just semi safe area. See if I can help. That's what I'm doing. Let me go any closer. No one can go in to get the people out. There's small explosions still going on. It's not a thing that you think about. You just move, try to get out of the way. Uh, that's it. Be thankful that I wasn't in closer to the, the bravery of the people who went in there or something else. Some of the hijacked passengers managed to make cell phone calls to their partners and family before impact. Mark Bingham called his sister and mother before his plane crashed in Pennsylvania. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. That the point
plane has been taken over by hijackers. And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. He said, I, I want you to know I love you very much. And uh, I'm uh, calling you uh, from the plane. Uh, we've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. And I said, well, who are they, Mark? And uh, he said, he repeated that he loved me. And he said, I, I, I don't think he said, I don't know who they are. He just, he, he became distracted there as if someone was speaking to him. Television network presenter Barbara Olson called her husband before crashing and also tried to call the FBI. Ruth McCourt and her daughter Juliana died in the second plane to crash into the World Trade Center. Her brother Ronnie, by coincidence, was working there and escaped and later talked to his brother John. He said that he had a feeling his sister, my sister, had left Logan Airport to go to Los Angeles with her daughter around 7.30 in the morning. So we were then concerned that my sister could have been on either of the two flights that crashed into the towers and uh, has been confirmed that she was on that flight with her daughter. British lawyer Mark Oliver was working on the 57th floor of the North Tower when it was struck. I then turned to look out the window and I then what made me turn to look outside of the window. But I was standing right by the window and just on the other side of the window was what I now appreciate was um, what was the remains of the plane. Um, and that, that was a truly horrific sight of what was falling literally within three feet of my face. Um, you know, or what was obviously burning fuel that was alight. Um, uh, sorry. Um, they were, they were um, play, not planes, um, chairs. I saw a shoe go past. We'd gone down about five stories from the 44th floor when we suddenly lots of screaming from above us to move to the right and to move into single file. And um, the burns and the walking wounded were, were walked past us and people obviously rushing to get them down. To, you know, they were the priority to, to get them down. The stories of the lucky and narrow escapes are welcome at a time when disbelief is still so prevalent and the potential loss of life so enormous. In the days to come, good news from New York will increasingly be more difficult to find. Colin Baker, ITN. Throughout this evening, information has been coming into the ITV newsroom. Helen Wright is there. Helen, what other information do we have tonight about what happened on board those hijacked planes? Trevor, utterly chilling details of other things that happened on board those hijacked planes. For example, air crew being seized and stabbed within minutes of one plane taking off. Uh, another uh, passenger on one of the planes calling his wife saying, I know we're going to die. Some of us are going to try and do something about it. And reports that air traffic controllers heard the hijackers on one of the planes telling the crew, we have other planes, we have other planes. And here in London tonight, a warning from Downing Street that it is likely that British casualties in New York will run into hundreds. So some terrible events, but there have also been, as we said, stories of quite remarkable heroism. Absolutely. Reports of emergency crews being taken to hospital with injuries they've sustained, clawing through debris and rubble with their bare hands. Um, I've heard reports of one firefighter continuing to work while his brother, another firefighter, was among the 250 or so emergency workers still missing, presumed dead. And uh, heroic tales from ordinary New Yorkers who have uh, mounted a round-the-clock service to keep emergency crews uh, fed, to provide drinks for them, uh, others who've donated clothing for those who've lost absolutely everything, other volunteers who've set up shelters for those who can't go back to their homes. And I think you have some information, Helen, about how tomorrow the world, in a rare show of unanimity, will mark the events of yesterday. Yeah, in London tomorrow, the Queen has ordered a special changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace as a sign of a respect and in mourning for those who lost their lives in New York. Friday has also been de declared a day of mourning across Europe. And in London on Friday, there will be a special service at St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, which the Queen is due to attend. That'll be for the friends and relatives of uh, victims of these tragedies in America. Helen Wright, thank you. The world remembering what happened in America yesterday. In what could be an ominous sign, hospitals in New York have been admitting that the number of people they, uh, they admitted were less than they expected. 
That points to only one thing, sadly, the possibility of a large number of bodies in the mounds of rubble. Staffing levels have been tripled, but the mayor of New York said today that so far only 1,700 people are known to have been treated. Here's our medical correspondent, Sue Savile. The frustration for hospitals dealing with the aftermath of this devastation is that so few casualties were brought in today. Fewer than 2,000 people are thought to have been treated in New York's hospitals so far, yet thousands more are believed missing. The indications are ominous. While the hospitals wait for the injured to arrive, rescue workers search desperately in the rubble for anyone who might still be alive. Some of those trapped in the debris have made calls for help from their mobile phones. Ambulances ferried the injured to hospitals where relatives and friends have been waiting anxiously for news. But it will be some time yet before firms can account for all their office workers who might have been in the buildings. Emergency workers themselves are known to be among the casualties. We did lose an ambulance. One of our ambulances was crushed in the debris. Um, but our hearts certainly go out to our colleagues uh, in the fire department and, and in the police department and, and all of the other victims. Urgent appeals went out for people to give blood to help the expected thousands of casualties. It's a big catastrophe and uh, I'm Israeli and I hope that now people understand what we have to deal with, the kind of people that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just a catastrophe. Hundreds of people queued up at the American Red Cross to give blood. Many had no idea of their blood group as they'd never given blood before. Donation centers created makeshift wards to cope with the numbers wanting to help. Some knew they had a more rare blood group and that supplies would be quickly depleted. Day and night, the rescue teams have been working non-stop. The fact that emergency workers themselves will be among the dead will add to the psychological impact of such a colossal tragedy, says one British expert. The effect of so many emergency workers being killed in this will be quite devastating to the emergency services in general. I think as the general public we often take the emergency services for granted and sometimes see them as a bit of an irritant where they close off streets and so on. We often forget that they put themselves in harm's way very frequently and experience a very real risk of death. In this particular instance, I think that the surviving emergency workers who are directly involved may well be at risk of enduring psychiatric difficulties in the future. Workers and rescuers at the Pentagon building in Washington will be going through similar experiences. Dedicated 24-hour mental health phone lines have been set up to help those affected begin to cope with what's happened. Sue Saville, ITN. With me now in the studio is Dr. Annie McGuinness. She's an accident and emergency doctor at University College Hospital in London. Dr. McGuinness, we know a great deal, sadly in modern life now, about dealing with trauma. But surely the events of yesterday are on a vastly different scale to most things we've seen before. Well, they're certainly very different from anything we've had to, uh, to deal with in the UK or Europe or America. Um, mass casualties like this usually happen in more remote parts of the world which don't have the medical facilities available in, in the US. So does that make it any easier in America or how, how difficult is it nevertheless to treat? I, I think that uh, this is an immense disaster and the people dealing with it will be very affected by it. Uh, for a start, the scale of the disaster in downtown Manhattan will have shocked the people of the core who work there and I believe there are large east numbers of of probably very badly injured people coming through. What helps people to cope is practice and teamwork. And the Americans are you know, experts in trauma training and in trauma teamwork. And I'm sure they will have well-rehearsed teams for dealing with, uh, with the average types of civilian uh, casualties and shootings and, and road disasters. What they will not be familiar with is probably the, uh, the extent and the nature of the, of the physical trauma to the victims of accidents like this, which is, is different. and quite distressing sometimes for the medical and nursing personnel who have to deal with it. So they might, they might find that more distressing uh, for different reasons than, than road accidents and shootings and stuff. Because this is, a, this is an enormous dilemma here, isn't it? Somebody comes in <coughs> with physical injuries. There is, of course, a huge range of psychological problems, perhaps, also to be dealt with. Uh, with the victims themselves or with the staff? With, 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 with people who've, who've survived. Victims, though, injured. Well, 
the, the immediate victims who have to go to theatre and have operations and so on uh, usually um, deal with the, that, that surgery and post-surgery phase quite well. In the long term, the victims and the, and the viewers and the relatives of victims can have psychological problems. What about the, uh, you referred to this earlier, what about the basic business of people who were there and who managed to survive unscathed? We look back at them and think, great good fortune. But of course, they still have problems in returning to this, to this arena, to this territory. Sometimes people who have been passive onlookers or not had a role to do in, in extricating and helping people um, have uh, psychological difficulties. And sometimes they feel guilty that they're the one that escaped when, when all the random uh, uh, or were killed or maimed or injured. And, and people, there are mechanisms, there are p ways of dealing with this. They have psychological counsellors and so on. Dr. McGuinness, thank you very much. Let's turn now to reaction around the world, beginning with developments here in Britain. Tonight, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner said there could be hundreds of British dead. Parliament is to be recalled. The Prime Minister promised again to help America in the fight against terrorism. Here's our political editor, John Sargent. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner left Downing Street tonight with Jack Straw. He told the Foreign Secretary and other ministers at the meeting that the number of British people killed in the attack was likely to run into hundreds. The official signs of mourning were in evidence with flags at Westminster and in Downing Street at half-mast. The Prime Minister emphasised that this was Britain's tragedy as well as America's. Given the likely death toll, there will be many citizens of other states who will have died. I have to say to you that I fear significant numbers of them will be British. So in a very real and direct sense, the interests of this country are engaged. A flood of calls to the Scotland Yard helpline later produced the forecast of a British death toll running into hundreds. Mr Blair also stressed that in a broader sense, America was by no means the only target, a point he'd agreed with other world leaders. We all agreed that this attack is an attack not only on America, but on the free and democratic world. It demands our complete and united condemnation, our determination to bring those responsible to justice, and our full support for the American people at this time of trial. Mr. Blair announced that MPs would come back for a special debate on Friday. I believe Parliament should be recalled both because of the sheer magnitude of what has happened and its implications, but also because this was an attack not just on a number of buildings in the United States of America, but on the very notion of democracy. Mr. Blair wouldn't comment directly on claims that Muslim extremists were responsible for the attack, but showing a clear concern for race relations in this country, he welcomed some of the comments from Muslim spokesmen. As Muslim leaders and clerics around the world are making clear, such acts of infamy and cruelty are wholly contrary to the Islamic faith. The vast majority of Muslims are decent, upright people who share our horror at what has happened. Questioned afterwards, the Prime Minister would not reveal how far Britain would be prepared to go in supporting American retaliation. They will take the action that they consider appropriate. As I said earlier, what support we may give to that um, is something that we will consider at the appropriate time, but be under no doubt at all um, we stand with the United States of America in this matter. The Foreign Secretary made a brief trip to Brussels, where he met other European Union ministers in a determined attempt to reach a common position. This attack happened on the soil of the United States, but it was an attack on all of us, an attack on freedom and democracy and civilization and on humanity. The NATO Secretary General, Lord Robertson, was also there, stressing the need for a united alliance against the terrorists. Uh, this is uh, an act of solidarity of uh, the European Union and NATO standing together at a day of profound tragedy, where the threat and the attack was not on the United States of America, but on the civilized world as a whole. So it's a very visible indication and symbol of where we stand, and we stand firm, we stand committed. Thank you very much. But the test of unity will come when it's known how the United States intend to react. John Sargent, ITN, Westminster.
And now we can go live to Downing, Downing Street to join our political editor, John Sargent. John, the Prime Minister and the President spoke for about 20 minutes today. Uh, presumably that wasn't just giving words of support to the Americans, it was much, much more. It was much more, Trevor, there's no doubt about that. I think this has been a very carefully coordinated response involving the Prime Minister and the President and America's allies across the world. What Mr Blair was trying to do is what every British Prime Minister is trying to do on these occasions, which is to make clear that when America is in difficulty, Britain is her best ally. So this conversation of 20 minutes, I'm sure it was extremely important, and Mr. Blair would take it as a sign of how well he can get on with Mr. Bush compared with the brilliant way they got on with Bill Clinton. What we do know is that when Mr. Bush spoke later of the need for patience and taking time in considering what action America would take in retaliation, those words, patience and taking time, were expected by British officials. They do not expect an instant American response. And I'm sure that was one of the key subjects discussed by the two men in their call earlier. Now, John, Mr. Blair said it again today that an attack on America in this fashion was an attack on all democratic countries. Is there the sense that he is trying, or he is in the vanguard, of trying to form this consensus to decide internationally what action should be taken? I think this is extremely important. We talked about this yesterday, Trevor, this question of how far the Prime Minister went in his initial reaction, and he went much further than other world leaders. He didn't just simply show concern and sympathy for America, he immediately aligned Britain alongside America by saying it's an attack on all the free democracies of the world. Now that line that Mr Blair took he took, as it were, on his own. It was a British government initial line. But it's interesting the way that other world leaders have moved away from general condolences to talking exactly that same language. And I think we did see, although this is not confirmed by Downing Street officials, we did see the Prime Minister going perhaps two steps ahead of other world leaders because he instantly realized how important it was to make sure there was a unified position and it was a political decision, not just a matter of sympathy. John Sargent in Downing Street, thank you. In the Middle East, Israel's president and the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat both gave blood to be sent to the United States. There was also condemnation for those who had celebrated the attack. Meanwhile, dozens of men, women and children held a vigil outside the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. Our Middle East correspondent John Irvine reports. It's been a national day of mourning in Israel, a day for people here to reach out and share the grief of this country's closest ally. The sympathy felt across Israel was on display outside the US Embassy on the Tel Aviv seafront. This is just a short distance from the scene of a suicide bombing in June that claimed 22 Israeli lives. People here understand America's pain. I can relate to the, to the suffering, and if I can do something to help, then I'll do, I'll do everything. Many Israelis have been giving blood to be sent on to America. So too have some Palestinians, most notably Yasser Arafat. Outside the American consulate in Arab East Jerusalem, Palestinians have demonstrated their sorrow. These scenes contrast sharply, but are more representative than yesterday's images of celebration. Hundreds of Palestinians have died in the fighting here so these people believe they can also empathize with distraught Americans. It's very saddening for everybody for the lives that were lost, and this is no way to gain anything for whoever was trying to send their message. I don't think this is the way to send a message. Today, the conflict that may be used as an excuse for the slaughter in the States has continued unabated. Israeli armored units mounted an incursion into a Palestinian-ruled town on the West Bank. At least nine Palestinians were killed in the gun battle. Such raids by the Israelis used to provoke American condemnation, but not today. John Irvine, ITN, Jerusalem. Earlier today at his embassy here in London, I spoke to the American ambassador, William Farish. I began by asking him how such a horrific attack could have taken place. It's very hard at this point, Trevor, because we're sitting over here in London and we're getting bits and pieces from Washington, but I think it's too soon to know, you know, exactly how, other than the fact that uh, 
Uh, you know, we know that, that uh, these airplanes uh, and probably a whole team of people that were well coordinated, uh, including pilots, were, were enlisted to pull this, this incredible uh, uh, tragedy off. President Bush, and it has been echoed here by Prime Minister Tony Blair, has talked about finding those responsible for, those, for this evil and making sure that they're brought to justice. Mr. Ambassador, that's easier said than done. Of course it is. Of course it is. And, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of emotional uh, reaction to something like this uh, when it happens. Uh, I, I think that, you know, obviously uh, our country has uh, total resolve to, to find who has done this and bring them to justice. I don't think there's any question in that. And the pres president's been very clear, uh, and so has the secretary of state on that. Are you pleased, sir, about the response from the British government? I couldn't be more pleased, uh, mainly with, with Prime Minister Blair's reactions yesterday at the conference, uh, uh, the uh, uh, foreign minister, uh, the secretary of, uh, of, of, the, of state. Everybody's reaction in the government has been uh, outstanding, as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Ambassador, what do acts such as these do to your country? Do they make America want to get continually involved in things like the crises in the Middle East, to which there must be solutions in other parts of the world? Or do they make people, do they drive the nation into a greater kind of introspection, looking in on itself? Of course, we've never had something like this happen. I don't think anybody has in, in, in modern peacetime. Uh, I don't think that this will, will cause our country to become isolationist. I think, on the other hand, it will make a, our country focus <clears throat> and our countrymen all over the world far more on the threat, worldwide threat of terror as, as uh, I mean, Pearl Harbor taking us back to the last, in, anywhere near a similar situation to, to, to Americans. Uh, all of a sudden, the country rallied behind the president and behind uh, the uh, war effort. To what extent does it shatter so many of the common assumptions about ordinary American life? Because Americans basically do not expect these types of things to happen on their territory. We're a free society, and in a free society, <clears throat> like ours and like and and and, and like yours, uh, we don't expect these things to happen. Uh, uh, but I think that um, you know, as I say, I think our country will rally behind uh, behind the president and will uh, will will rise to the occasion. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. America's ambassador to Britain talking to me earlier today. Joining me now is Professor. Gwyn Brins, an expert on terrorism, especially in the Middle East. Professor Brins, can I begin with this? The intriguing reports tonight that the terrorists actually intended to hit either the White House or Air Force One. How credible can these be? Well, we know a little bit more about this because just before we went on air, I was watching Ari Fleischer, the White House spokesman, addressing the press conference. And firstly, it appears that the aircraft which hit the Pentagon may well actually have had the White House as its target. But the question about uh, Air Force One is intriguing and perplexing, as one of the journalists pointed out, because as he said to Mr. Fleischer, are you suggesting with the president on Air Force One in, in Florida... He, by the way, is one of the presidential spokesmen. That's right. Are you suggesting that one of these four planes was a threat, because that doesn't look credible? Surely there must have been some other form of threat, which you haven't yet told us about, and uh, the presidential spokesman didn't want to go any further into that. So I'm sure we'll hear more about this in due course. Analyze for us, if you will, the language, the tone that President Bush, and for that matter, Secretary of State Colin Powell used today in describing how America will calibrate its response to these attacks. Well, I, I think that three things are now beginning to come together. Firstly, we're moving from circumstantial evidence to much harder evidence. Uh, we know that because the following up of the phone taps that have led to the arrests 
experts in Florida and in Boston seem to be providing direct evidence of the bin Laden organization's involvement. Secondly, as you say, we have to rely very heavily on a close reading of what the president's been saying. And he's been, in the first speech, talking about the fact that there would be no distinction made between the perpetrators and those harboring them. And then both he and the Secretary of State speaking uh, repeatedly about this being a state of war. And that links to the third thing, which I believe to be potentially momentous, which is the resolution of NATO to invoke Article 5. Yes, Lord Robertson talked about it this evening. That's right. Well, this is the core article of the NATO alliance, whereby an attack on one is an attack on all. But it means that if the Americans should choose, say, to bomb parts of Afghanistan or Pakistan, and this is all speculation now, then we join in. Then we go to war. That's what it means. Yes. Extraordinary consequences. Well, I think we can be a little more... Uh, nuanced about this because when Lord Robertson was asked that question he said of course invocation is distinct from the United States making an actual request and at this stage we are still some distance from that. Professor Prince, thank you. It's a pleasure. News in the aftermath of yesterday's attacks continue to reverberate at airports around the world. There's no sign of transatlantic flights resuming. Flights to Canada, to Pakistan and many to Israel are still halted. Security at British airports has been tightened, and experts say we can all expect changes to the way we travel abroad, especially to America. Here's Chris Choi. At first, it was all unbelievable and far away. Today, the aftershocks brought it all closer to home, into everyday life. Passengers at Heathrow tonight unable to fly because America's skies remain closed. London City Airport shut down after the capital declared its airspace an exclusion zone. As elsewhere, upgraded baggage security in Manchester. Overall, an estimated 25,000 travellers stranded. We rent a car for two weeks, uh, already paid, and we wanted to go to the Great uh, Lakes in the USA. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's a dreadful situation, and I realise it's nobody's fault here, so we don't blame anybody. Now they told us that uh, they booked us for a flight for Tuesday, it's about a week away. Um, but hopefully maybe something will open up before then. They just don't know what's happening currently. The travel disruption is, is rippling through airspace around the globe at the moment. What advice are you offering? It is hard to predict whether the flights will get off the ground again over the next day or so. I'm hopeful we might have flights tomorrow, but I, I simply can't predict. As soon as they do get off the ground again, tour operators and airlines will be trying to get customers back who were due to travel over the last two or three days. The biggest and most rapid security upgrade since the Gulf War has brought another tier of problems. Increased baggage and personal checks are slowing down the rate of flights to all destinations. Travel to Canada and Pakistan is affected by airspace exclusion zones. Tel Aviv is off the BA schedule. Only El Al is now being allowed to land in Israel. The issue is, of course, that there are crew and there are aircraft all over the place. And there is obviously some congestion on the ground here possibly some congestion in Europe. It is a big logistical operation to get people, aircraft, in the right place at the right time to get the program flying again. Yesterday, terrorists proved what brutality is possible. What we still don't know is what effective response is possible. But today, aviation security experts predicted that air travel will never be the same again. The stringent safeguards at international airports are not matched on America's internal flights, where terrorists struck yesterday, and where the single security question for travellers can be, is this your bag? The security compared to the security at London, I would say, would be on a par, if you take London at 100%, there's 5%. They're not interested. They weren't interested in security whatsoever. Fingerprint technology could be the answer, allowing more reliable identification checks. One system has already been trialled in Britain. It would be a massive change for American domestic flights, often seen as more like getting on a bus. What we certainly saw in the 1970s, uh, after the spate of hijackings, international hijackings, was international airline security being stepped up. That never happened in the US domestically. Lapses in security are more shocking given that low standards were identified by a vice presidential commission. The Federal Aviation Authorities launched a £300 million programme to tighten security, but lessons went unheeded. We used to get tested by the FAA. Federal Aviation Authority chaps used to come over and test us. Then they used to debrief us. And one of the questions was raised at the time that we're doing all this in-depth security here in Europe. 
but it's going to happen in your own back garden because there's no security. And his answer was that it will not happen, a terrorist act on American soil. Stranded passengers are now bedding down for another night of discomfort, but nobody is waiting for the return of business as usual. Instead, there's a growing clamor for change. Flags at half-mast show one immediate response from the airline industry to the tragedy that has shocked the world. What many passengers now want is a radical and far-reaching reaction to stop it ever happening again. Chris Choi, ITN, Heathrow. And Adrian Britton is at Heathrow Airport tonight. Adrian, it's not at all surprising that flights to Heathrow came to a rather sudden stop. Any, any news this evening about a possible timetable for their resumption? Well, the feeling here tonight, Trevor, is that there will be no change, no flights uh, leaving for the States until at least Friday. Now, that all depends on the Federal Aviation Authority of the United States. Uh, they met today at 5 p.m. British time to discuss the restrictions. And, in fact, there was something of a buzz of excitement around this airport when they did meet, because I think a few airlines thought when they said uh, that there would be no lifting of the restrictions until after their meeting, uh, they thought that meant, well, perhaps the restrictions would be lifted after the meeting. So what we had uh, was uh, Air Canada, for example, um, beginning to check in a few passengers, and those passengers making it through to the departure lounge. American Airlines at one stage were hopeful of getting a flight out at 5.35, and that brought a few passengers to the uh, check-in desk. Uh, those passengers had been at the terminal. They didn't want to leave because they obviously wanted to be on the, the first flight out. Well, of course, the restrictions haven't been lifted. Um, passengers now are back at hotels, or as Chris said, in the terminal. If they're in the hotels, they're lucky to find a room and uh, pay the extra prices. But if things do come to a crunch, then the officials here at the airport have arranged with local authorities um, even to provide schools in the area um, for bedding and to get a shelter. But if you're hoping to go to the States, don't hold out any hope until at least Friday. Adrian, what are they saying tonight about the point raised by Chris Choi in his report about the increased need for more restrictions, perhaps, in the long term, more security restrictions now? Yes, Trevor. I mean, we, we've heard a lot over the last two days, haven't we, from commentators and politicians saying this attack is going to change the world. If you're a regular air traveller, then I think possibly you're going to feel the effects of this attack first, because we've even seen, you know, extra restrictions on flights going to Europe and other countries delayed by an hour because of these extra security measures. That's something perhaps we're all going to have to get used to. And one thing tonight which I have noticed, no passengers are complaining about these extra security measures. Adrian Britton, thank you. Now, finance ministers around the world promised today to try to make sure that these attacks don't push the global economy into recession. In the city of London, it was not business as usual. Thoughts inevitably turned to friends and colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic. Our business editor, Caroline Kerr, reports. 24 hours after yesterday's devastating events, the city observed a minute's silence. A small mark of respect for friends and colleagues in New York who lost their lives on what should have been just another routine day at work. The oppressive memory of yesterday's catastrophe was inescapable in the city today. Cantor Fitzgerald was particularly affected. A thousand people worked at the company's sister office based in the World Trade Center. They haven't heard that any of them are alive. There are 160 hospitals in New York City and you're just praying and hoping that you get a few phone calls from people who come out from little burns operations and concussion and stuff saying hello I'm still here and that as you can imagine is what we're all fixed on and we're desperate for some good news. Elsewhere city traders put on a brave face but nobody could pretend it was business as usual. It's now 2.30 on a normal day New York would just have started trading but this, of course, is not a normal day. The New York Stock Exchange is closed indefinitely. And the last time anything like that happened was in the depths of the Great Depression. There is real anxiety that when trading resumes on Wall Street, possibly at the beginning of next week, panic will set in and markets around the world will nosedive. It's feared the destruction of America's financial center could push the world economy into full-blown recession, in part because of the irreparable damage these images will have on the confidence of the American public. We have never seen anything like this before. We may have seen bomb attacks and things like this, but this is completely different on a totally different scale. Not only the human calamity that's occurred, but the impact on the financial services industry, the level of talent and experience and expertise that may well have been destroyed here uh, makes uh, a great hole in our industry. 
The Bank of England and other central banks are now expected to cut rates fast in an attempt to stave off recession. And tonight, the Chancellor was talking up the economy. Everybody is resolute in the determination not only to keep the economies and the markets moving, which is an important message to send to those people who wanted to disrupt them, but they will, we will do everything in our power to maintain the conditions for stability and growth. But as they set off for home tonight, city workers admitted that for once, the economy wasn't their biggest concern. It's been a, a terrible, terrible, very sad mood in, in the city today, very quiet. Been very quiet, no phones ringing, a lot of people being silent, just, just really sad. I think it's taken time to sink in, um, but I think the long-term effects will take a long time for everyone to come to terms with. As flags flew at half-mast this evening, there was little doubt that both the human and the economic impact of yesterday's events would hang over the city for a very long time. Caroline Kerr, ITN, The City. I'm joined now in the studio by Andrew Rathmull, a terrorism analyst for a firm of security advisors. Mr Rathmull, is it now inevitable that we see the beginning of an era of tighter security uh, from which we'll not be able to escape? I think that may well take place. Uh, let's remember that in the UK and to some extent in Europe, we have had tighter security for quite a long time because of the terrorism we've experienced. The US will now have to adopt some of the same standards we have in Europe. But on a global level, we have crossed a threshold here. This was a successful terrorist attack of a level which terrorists have been trying to achieve for a while. And the rest of the world, including Europe and the UK, will have to adapt to that. So we may well see a new era of security here. The, the problem is, though, and I think we've referred to this before, whatever level of security you have, whatever level of security you possess, an attack like this cannot be always protected against. That's true. Uh, terrorists will always be successful in a, I say, in a free society, even a dictatorship, terrorists will be successful. So a balance has to be struck somewhere. It will be a balance, and we may well, uh, or the US, when it assesses its performance here, will obviously, uh, I think, uh, determine that it, it's uh, too far on the side of liberty, ease of travel and so forth. In the UK, though, I think we will be reassessing this as well. And again, we may well decide in certain areas uh, our balance is already shifted too far to the side of liberty uh, and freedom. But, but in America, those things, those concepts, freedom and liberty, are part of the very fabric of their lives. They'll give these things up extremely reluctantly. They will, but societies have always compromised. Remember, during the Cold War, uh, the US uh, did give up much of its, some of its freedom, some of its liberty to fight the Cold War. And indeed, in 1941, after Pearl Harbor, it became a militarized society for a few years. So the US has adjusted before. Uh, it may well adjust again. There is, of course, another point. The enormous financial cost of all this. These things don't come cheaply. Certainly not. There's a financial cost in terms of increased security to firms and also to individuals, of course, of inconvenience. We've seen that in London. We will see that on air travel and in other forms of travel in the future. But also for firms. Uh, firm, many of the firms in the World Trade Center had back up. Uh, they invested a lot of money in security and recovery. More and more firms will now focus on that area to ensure that their businesses continue even in the face of catastrophes like this. Andrew Rathmull, thank you. Thank you. And now, just an update for anyone expecting to see Coronation Street. It was scheduled to begin at 9.45. It's about to be shown on ITV2. Because, as I'm sure you'd understand, we're continuing our extended reporting of the attacks yesterday on New York and in Washington. So as we move towards the headlines at 10 o'clock, it's time to reflect on what an extraordinary change these attacks have caused to the famous Manhattan skyline. The skyline, of course, has been the image on millions of postcards and the backdrop to hundreds of films and television programs. Or at least, until yesterday, it was. John Draper reports. Manhattan's famous skyline before the terrorists did their worst. Of course, the damage to buildings pales into insignificance compared with the loss of human life. But the New York skyscrapers do represent an image of America, vibrant, self-confident and optimistic, and that too has been attacked. The Twin Towers dominating downtown Manhattan have been photographed endlessly and from every angle. Some see their destruction as similar to an environmental disaster. New York without the Twin Towers, if you like, is like Paris without the Eiffel Tower. It's like Sydney without the Opera House. There's something incredibly sacred about that view. 
um, to me, that view plus the, the other places I described, uh, they don't really belong to anybody. Uh, they're just part of the landscape and, you know, inherently fascinating. The New York skyline has provided the backdrop for scores of Hollywood films set in Manhattan. For millions around the world, this image is the United States. And if popular culture loved Manhattan, Manhattan was dominated by the Twin Towers. You always see the image over the tops of other buildings. You never, unless you're right up next to them, you never see the bases of those buildings. So it's, it's always this figure on the skyline. And, and because they're so large, it's very difficult to tell how, just how large they are, which means it's very difficult to tell how far away they are. This is what's left of them. New Yorkers at the moment can think only of the appalling toll in lives, but when the time does come to rebuild, some Americans, like singer Gene Pitney on tour in Britain, want the towers to go up again. I would like to see them put that back up again to defy anybody saying that this happened before and just make sure that it can't happen again. The skyline may never be the same again, but more importantly, neither will America, neither will the survivors and the bereaved. John Draper, ITN. And if you're just joining this broadcast, we've been on the air for the last hour, bringing you extended reports on the hijacked airplane attacks in the United States. Now the time is about 10 o'clock. Here are tonight's headlines. The death toll mounts reports that hundreds could be British. FBI arrests tonight in a desperate search for the guilty. And an eyewitness video from the scene of the attack. President Bush talked today of fighting back in a war of what he called a good against evil. As FBI officers made raids in Boston and in Florida in the hunt for those behind yesterday's attacks in New York and in Washington. American security services now believe that President Bush himself may have been a target. In Manhattan today, it was another day of desperation and of frightening memories. James Mates is in New York tonight. You may find some pictures in his report upsetting. I am hearing horrible numbers. The numbers that we're working on are in the thousands. This is beyond description. This is an assault against the civilized world. On the southern end of Manhattan, the civilized world is no more. Shrouded in dust, buried under hundreds of thousands of tons of rubble. The beating heart of the American financial system is still. Thousands of people who came innocently to work yesterday morning now lie entombed. Bright lives snuffed out by the fanaticism of men from a far off land with whom they had no quarrel. No one, not the rescuers, not the families, not the stunned inhabitants of New York. No one has yet absorbed the scale of what has happened here. There is news of miraculous survival in the rubble, of split-second decisions that meant the difference between life and death. But towering over the individual stories is the gaping hole in the New York skyline that tells of so many individuals lost. The fire crews work on, knowing that at least 250 of their colleagues who rushed into the burning buildings yesterday morning never came out. Police officers, paramedics, Dozens of them rushed towards, not away from the disaster, and paid for their courage with their lives. I talked to some of them right, right before, maybe 10, 15 minutes before the building collapsed and, and we lost them, and then had to talk to their families last night and explain it to them, which, of course, you can't explain. All over the city, people with their cameras recorded images that their eyes struggled to believe. This, the first airliner to hit the Twin Towers. From that moment, dozens of cameras pointed skywards with utter incomprehension at what was happening. What's this other jet doing? What's this other jet doing? Oh. oh my god! Oh my god! People have been trying to make sense of the first crash when the second happened right above them. A World Trade Center, glass flew everywhere.
Images beyond disbelief. But the horror on the ground was as nothing to the horror of those trapped in the towers. What was happening up there that people chose to jump rather than face it any longer? The collapse of the towers snuffed out hope, snuffed out thousands of lives. On the ground, a paramedic, Dr. Mark Heath, was approaching the second tower looking for victims when it began to give way above him. people who need help. I don't think I'm one of them. You okay, sir? Okay. Can I just get a toot off your respirator? Yeah. Can I get a toot? I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. Struggling to breathe, he begged oxygen from a firefighter. That's good. Okay. If ever there was an image of hell on earth. The authorities are reluctant to talk about how many are dead. The senior senator from New York just hinted at how bad it might be. I am hearing horrible numbers that uh, this is going to be far and away the worst, worst killing of civilians from this type of thing uh, ever in America. Are we talking many, five many, figures, Senator? Uh, we may get that at that level and it's yes uh, they had much more success evacuating the first tower of the World Trade Center than they did the second at the White House President Bush will have been briefed on these casualty estimates this morning flanked by his cabinet and congressional leaders he made it plain he regarded yesterday as a declaration of war the deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror they were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. America's united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil, but good will prevail. Thank you very much. But when the heavy armor showed up, Already police raids have been carried out in Boston from where one of the airliners was hijacked. Arrests have been made, and there's a promise from Secretary of State Colin Powell of action, not just against the terrorists responsible, but any country that harbors them. And once uh, this trail leads us to who is responsible, if there are nations that bear responsibility in that regard for hosting them, then uh, we will be uh, doing something about that as well. All night and all day, ambulances ferried away the injured. More than 1,400 altogether now lying in New York hospitals. At one point, there was a ripple of applause as news came of a survivor being pulled from the rubble. Nine people, for the most part firefighters or police officers, have been dug out alive so far. The heat, the smoke, the suffocating dust may mean that there are not many more still to be found. The air here is still thick with the smell of smoke. The bright afternoon sun still struggling in places to penetrate the cloud of ash and dust that hangs over lower Manhattan. The emphasis here is still very much on search and rescue. They still believe there are people alive in there, 
The rescue teams will be working all day and all night. For everybody else, this is as close as we can get. The rescue, the cleanup, counting the dead, accounting for the missing. This is going to take weeks, not days. What we are looking at here is one of the biggest civil disasters in US history, the biggest ever to have been caused by the hand of man. Long before the last of this rubble is cleared away, expect the United States to have struck back. James Mates, ITN, New York City. James Mates joins me now live in New York. James, are people in New York today still living the horrors of what happened there yesterday? Not only, I think, the people in New York, people all over the United States, all over the world. The events of yesterday, those pictures, some of the most disturbing that I've ever had to report on. Uh, awful, awful scenes. And don't forget that here in New York, so many people will have been affected by that. People who knew someone who was in that building, or at the very least, know someone who knew someone who was in that building. Many, many lives affected. I listened to Mayor Giuliani today of New York and Senator Hillary Clinton, who is the center for the area, of course, who was in Washington, talking about the will to fight back and to rebuild New York and to get some sense back of all those shining monuments. Is, is that a sort of realistic proposition, looking at what you saw today and looking at those amazing pictures we saw in your report? Well, yes, certainly in the long term, yes. Uh, Mayor Giuliani has been indomitable here. He only just escaped from this himself. He was in a building nearby when the first tower collapsed. They whisked him away just before the second one collapsed, which took out the building he had been in. So he's lived through this with New Yorkers and is showing real leadership here. Uh, he says they will rebuild their skyline. That is something they can do. They can never replace the perhaps thousands who have died, but they can rebuild the skyline. Whether they ever do it again with a, uh, with a building quite as proud and, uh, and as tall as the World Trade Center's, in case it too were to become a target for a future attack, that'll be a debate for years to come. James Mates in New York, thank you. As we have seen, emergency teams have been working for 24 hours now and more to try to bring out bodies and to try to find survivors in New York and at the Pentagon in Washington. It's been a day of heartbreak for many, and for others, it's been a day of relief. Here's Shuri Ghosh. It seems incredible that anyone could have walked away unscathed after such a devastating attack. As rescue teams frantically searched the wreckage for survivors, relatives around the world waited for news. John Clifford from Ireland was relieved to hear his brother Ronnie had had a remarkable escape. He eventually made it, phoned to say that he was okay, traumatized that he was within an inch of his life. He went through the front uh, door of the ground floor and the lady who was about three seconds in front of him was hit by a terrific fireball. But hours later, the brothers learned their sister Ruth had been on board one of the planes which hit the World Trade Center. Tragically, she'd had her four-year-old daughter with her. He said that he had a feeling his sister, my sister, had left Logan Airport to go to Los Angeles with her daughter around 7.30 in the morning. So we were then concerned that my sister could have been on either of the two flights that crashed into the towers and uh, has been confirmed that she was on that flight with her daughter. There are many who've been touched by the tragedy. British lawyer Mark Oliver had been working on the 57th floor of the World Trade Center. He managed to get away just before the buildings collapsed. He spoke to ITV News about his experience. Suddenly there was an enormous violent lurch of the building. I was sort of flung forward into my desk. Um, the building then kind of ricocheted back and then was flung forward again. Um, second time slightly less violently. Um, I sort of shaken obviously and, and managed to, to get to my feet. It was at that point I saw what I now realized to be the wreckage of the plane falling past my window. Um, lots of burning fuel. There were uh, chairs, um, clothing and things that I maybe shouldn't describe on um, an interview falling past my window. On board the 757, which crashed near Pittsburgh, was public relations executive Mark Bingham. He'd boarded the flight at New Jersey for a business trip to San Francisco. In the last minutes of his life, he telephoned his sister and mother from the stricken aircraft to say goodbye. He just said, I want to let you all know that I love you very, very much in case I don't see you again. That the plane has been taken over by hijackers and 
And, um, and then I said, well, we love you very much too, Mark. Let me go get your mother. He said, I, I want you to know I love you very much. And uh, I'm uh, calling you uh, from the plane. Uh, we've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. Minutes later, his plane crashed, killing all 45 passengers and crew. Shuli Ghosh, ITN. Over the last 24 hours, the American security services have been piecing together how the hijackings and the attacks happened. What will take a little longer to evaluate is why the twin towers of the World Trade Center collapsed, having withstood the initial impacts. Here's our science editor, Lawrence McGinty. The pictures that have shot the world have also shown engineers how and why the twin towers of the World Trade Center were utterly destroyed. One surprise is the impacts of the two planes weren't enough to bring the towers crashing down. They were devastating, punching huge holes in the towers, but they stayed up. Structural engineers told me the crash impacts had less force than the stresses on the towers from strong winds. The towers were designed for hurricane winds. The, uh, the weight of those planes and the speed they were going wasn't enough to, to, uh, to knock them over, literally. It did enormous damage to the building, though, and blew a big hole in the side of it. But these two buildings were built in such a way that they were able to withstand that. In fact, the Trade Center towers were designed and built in the 60s with a lattice work of hollow steel columns on the outside of the building to withstand the force of the wind or of an airplane collision. They worked. So what did go wrong? The attack on the World Trade Center began 200 miles north in Boston. American Airlines Flight 11 for Los Angeles takes off at two minutes past eight, followed shortly after by United Airlines Flight 175, also destined for LA. Each aircraft is laden with some 37,000 liters of aviation fuel. That's about 30 tons. Hijackers then take over both flights, diverting them towards New York City. By 8.45 local time, the first plane is over the city, heading for the World Trade Center. The American Airlines Boeing 767, with 92 people on board, flies straight into the North Tower. A fireball erupts from a gaping hole in its north face. As smoke pours from the skyscraper, the second hijacked plane is approaching. At three minutes past nine, the United Airlines plane, with 65 on board, was directed towards the South Tower. The plane plowed into the building, exploding in a massive fireball. Experts at the Health and Safety Executive calculated for ITV News that temperatures reached 1,000 degrees centigrade for nine seconds. It was those fireballs that brought the towers down. Engineers say the heat affected the steel columns in the cores of the towers, columns which hold up the weight. Well, what happened is these interior columns, which are big steel sections, those interior columns were exposed to fire. And as they got hotter and hotter and hotter, they got weaker. It's like you know, warming up any metal. You can start to bend it after a certain temperature. And literally what happened is these got to the temperature at which they bent under the loads they had from building above. And they just collapsed down on themselves. From the beginning, the Trade Center was designed to be a symbol at 1,368 feet high, taller than the Empire State Building. The towers housed 50,000 workers as well as two restaurants and 75 shops. A symbol and a village, both now destroyed. Lawrence McGinty, ITN. Let's go live now to Helen Wright in the ITV newsroom. Helen, what more can you tell us about what the estimates are about the number of people from this country who may have perished in those attacks? Trevor, the grim warning from Downing Street tonight is that the death toll among British citizens is likely to run into hundreds. Now that estimate is based on the number of anxious relatives who've been calling a Scotland Yard helpline to say that they can't get in touch with, uh, with family members who are either working or visiting New York or Washington. That helpline has been inundated with a massive number of calls, as has the British consulate uh, in New York and Washington. Calls from both British citizens worried about their relatives and from uh, Americans here in the UK who can't get information about their loved ones in America. And I believe you have some news on how the world, in a show of unanimity, international unanimity, is trying, is, is attempting to mark the deaths of people in the United States tomorrow. 
Yep. Today, Israel has held a day of mourning. On Friday, a, a Europe-wide day of mourning has been declared. So every major European city uh, will have events uh, to pay their respects to those who lost their lives and to mourn those who lost their lives. On Friday uh, here in London, uh, there's going to be a special service at St Paul's Cathedral in London. Um, that's for relatives and friends of the victims and for American uh, citizens who are in the UK at the moment who want to mourn what has happened in their country. The Queen and senior government figures are expected to attend that service at St Paul's on Friday. Also tomorrow, uh, the Queen has ordered a special changing of the guard ceremony at Buckingham Palace uh, in honour of the victims of these terror attacks. Um, there will be a military band playing the US national anthem and a two-minute silence. Helen Wright in the ITV newsroom, thank you. In millions of homes around the world, people have been wondering why the events of yesterday occurred. What can drive terrorists, no matter how fanatical, to steer an aircraft into buildings packed with ordinary working people. Our diplomatic editor Robert Moore reports on who was probably to blame and what their motives might have been. This hire car being taken away by the FBI from Boston Airport is just part of the mounting evidence that points the finger towards a Middle Eastern connection. In the vehicle thought to be used by the hijackers, there were Arabic language flight training manuals. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, there were small-scale celebrations by Palestinians, a sign of the bitterness felt by many in the region towards America's support of Israel. But when Yasser Arafat today donated blood in an act of solidarity with New Yorkers, he was also making clear the vast majority of Arabs feel only shock and sympathy for the American people. But there are also those like Osama bin Laden, a Saudi national in hiding in Afghanistan, who have publicly declared war on America. Intelligence sources in the West are already suggesting the audacity of the attacks, the planning, and the choice of targets suggests a bin Laden-sponsored operation. If the link is confirmed, why they did it comes down to a sense among the most extreme elements of Islamic activists that America is the enemy. That view was firmly entrenched by the deployment of US troops in Saudi Arabia following the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. For the militants, these were infidels operating on Islamic holy ground. At the extreme fringe, there is a kind of sense of triumph that they've managed to fight back against the most powerful economic and military power in the world that they see as having suppressed their cause across the Middle East. The Israeli-Palestinian violence is the ongoing backdrop to the wider hatred aimed at the US. Many Arabs judge Washington as being heavily biased in policy terms, backing the Jewish state and providing it with a weaponry to attack the Palestinians. The beliefs that motivate those behind these suicidal strikes are based on the idea of a holy war. By dying in the process, they believe they will go to paradise. That is why extremists from Palestinian groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad have also adopted the policy of suicide attacks. As Israel has found out before and America yesterday, such fanaticism makes the terrorists almost impossible to stop. Bin Laden himself has a set of beliefs and a cunning that makes him a key American retaliatory target. He has the psychological steel uh, to want to do this sort of thing, and, and the imagination, um, macabre as it may be to say this, to create this perfect terrorist attack in terms of the symbolism of the targets that have been selected and destroyed. The rejectionists in the Arab world have an apocalyptic view about the United States and its support for Israel. They have seen, as they perceive it, uh, their cause uh, scorned and frustrated. Islamic extremists have long attached significance to the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. The skyscrapers were targeted back in 1993 with a car bomb. These are buildings seen as a symbol of American business and values. The most ominous question is, will they strike again? Was it a one-off attack of frightening success or the start of a new campaign? America is now taking extraordinary precautions, wholly proportionate to the president declaring the attacks an act of war. Naval battle groups, including aircraft carriers, have deployed off New York and California 
to protect America's east and west coasts. It is a war, and we've got to respond uh, in the sense that it isn't going to be solved with a single counterattack against one individual. It's going to be a long-term conflict, and it's going to be fought on many fronts. But even as U.S. leaders talk of responding, the reality is the world superpower has few answers to a well-organized operation by suicidal terrorists. That vulnerability is why it is truly an act of terror on all of America. Robert Moore, ITN. And our political editor, John Sargent, joins us once again in Downing Street. John, let me draw you a little further on this, if I may. This repeated transatlantic theme today about a carefully calibrated response to these attacks. That's right. I think there's no doubt now that everyone accepts that it's very important to get an alliance together condemning the terrorists, then to work out a proper proportionate response which will have the widest possible appeal. Now obviously the more carefully they prepare this, the greater the chances are for getting that unity. But I think everyone is aware that if the Americans appear to act in a rapid and an inappropriate way, they will do their cause enormous harm. So that's not a matter of dispute. It's not being disputed among the Allies. Everyone has agreed they've got to work together. Everyone agrees, if they can, that the response should be accurate and proportionate and popular across the world. Now, that's a very tall order. It may take a long time. And John, any sense of a semblance of return to normal political activity in Westminster tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, of course, we get a special cabinet meeting, so that's extraordinary. They'll discuss what's going to happen in the debate, the special debate on Friday, with Parliament unusually being recalled. But we've also got tomorrow one of the leftovers from the summer, the new Conservative leader. That'll be announced tomorrow afternoon, and, of course, their first big test will be on Friday when they will answer the Prime Minister in this debate on what should happen now with regard to the terrorist attack in America. John Sargent in Downing Street. Thank you. And that's the end of our extended special news tonight. The attacks on America have sent shockwaves throughout the world. So we leave you now with a reminder of some of the harrowing images from those attacks, images which have dominated both our screens and our thoughts over the last 30 hours.
Guardian. Gas, electricity and telephone. Good evening. Well, the weather's making absolutely no attempt to cheer us up at the moment. Wind and rain is the name of the game. And at the moment, we've got some wet weather across the southeast. That'll tend to ease away later on the night, but that's not the end of the story because more heavy rain will be piling into much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, some northern counties of England and Wales later on. Not only that, the wind's picking up to gale force in exposed places. It's going to feel cold out there. Now, tomorrow, the worst of the weather will be through this central slice, brighter on either side, and gradually we'll see the worst of the wind and the rain easing southeast with still gales in exposed places. The best of the weather by afternoon across Scotland and Northern Ireland, drying up, the winds easing down a touch, but most places cold. Power Gen. Gas, electricity and telephone. Midsummer Murders is back with John Nettles, Sunday at 8, and drama in Cold Feet, tonight at 11.45. Now, a place of psychic detective to be shown at a later date, a tonight special, War on the West. An unbelievable horror. An unspeakable atrocity. Untold thousands of victims. Why? Who? And what now? Good evening. Tonight, with the full scale of this catastrophe yet to unfold, there is no room for doubt. What happened yesterday was, in effect, an act of war on America, as the President said, on the West, indeed, on all of us. This was Manhattan at dawn this morning, on the dawn of a new kind of world, a new kind of threat, a world in which we are all prey to what Tony Blair has described as a new kind of evil. We've now seen those images of this evil again and again. They're numbing and incomprehensible, but they also describe a new reality. Who would do this and why? And what can be done to stop it happening again? Over the next hour, as we try to make sense of these questions, we hope to be hearing from some of the most influential and thoughtful voices from across the world. Starting with Philip Blader, who's here, the former ambassador to the United Kingdom, senior advisor to the Morgan Stanley Bank, which had its offices in the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, and someone who's worked at the most senior level in the White House. Um, Mr. Ambassador, before I ask you to respond in broader professional terms, you are closely linked to those people who were working in that tower. You must be filled with the most extreme anxiety for their fate. That has been the, the primary concern of all of us in the firm. But as I hope you understand, it's, it's not appropriate for me to comment further about that at this time. Like everyone else, you are waiting and presumably praying. Also with us here, Jamie Rubin, who served in the State Department, Lord Owen, the former British Foreign Secretary. Um, it is still, James Rubin, virtually impossible to comprehend this. Do you have a sense of what this has done to your country? Well, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in and around New York City. I, most of my adult life was spent there or near there. Uh, my family are all New Yorkers. I'm obviously an American. America has been attacked. But I also feel that I'm a citizen of the civilized world. And I, I really believe that as the world comes to really appreciate what's happened here, this attack on the World Trade Center is an attack on civilization itself. And it'll never be the same for me or any visitor to New York to fly to New York and not see the World Trade Center uh, in the skyline. And I think it's a reminder that the world has changed. It's changed utterly. Uh, what the result of that will be, what the response of that will be, is obviously something we can talk about, but it never will be the same. 